I'm delighted to introduce to you Rebecca Cook. Rebecca has a distinguished career. Uh, her titles include that she is faculty chair in international human rights. She's co-director of the International Reproductive and Sexual Health Law Program at University of Toronto. She's a professor in the Faculty of Law, a professor in the Faculty of Medicine, and the Joint Centre for Bioethics at U of T. Uh, and she has not two, not three, but six degrees to her name <laughs> uh, in the areas of arts, public administration, and law. So you can sense a polymath here. Uh, she is co-editor of numerous journals, um, ethical and legal issues co-editor of the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Uh, she serves on the editorial advisory boards of Human Rights Quarterly and Reproductive Health Matters. She has a publication list that is very, very extensive um, and her primary focus is on reproductive health and women's rights. I guess that's two focuses. Um, she is a modest person, um, and her accomplishments, though, are outrageously high when stacked against her modesty. Um, she has received uh, numerous awards and distinctions, and as you can tell just from the listing of the editorial boards that she sits on, she has a very strong international reputation. So um, the, one of the awards she's received is the Certificate of Recognition for Outstanding Contribution to Women's Health by the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She has received the Ludwig and Estelle Jus Memorial Human Rights Prize, and she is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a great distinction. Rebecca will be speaking with us today on discriminatory effects, oh, stigmatic harms of criminal abortion <laughs> laws, title has been slightly. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Thank you, Elaine. It's a pleasure to be here, and I do apologize for the change in title. Uh, Elaine was absolutely right. I started out with discriminatory effects of stigma, stereotyping, and animus. But that really uh, speaks to how comfortable I was in changing my title and the delight that I have in being here. This is a work, definitely a work in progress, and I really want to have your think together with you and have your feedback on this chapter. It's a draft of a chapter for a book on abortion law that Joanna Erdman, Bernard Dickens, and I are co-editing. It is very, very much of a draft, um, and I'm not even sure that I'm comfortable with this title. Uh, so my last slide in this presentation is uh, to come back to the ideas that I have on various titles and ask you, having, having heard the, the paper, ha, um, what you think might be uh, the most appropriate title. I think there are pros and cons of uh, different aspects of this, uh, uh, different aspects of the title that I want to discuss with you. So thank you, Elaine, and to the Health Law Institute for uh, making this possible to try out some of these ideas on uh, this work in progress. So the outline of the talk is really to look at the social meaning that has developed around abortion. One in three women will have or ha one in three women have abortions during their lifetime. It's a very, very common procedure but very, very stigmatized and rarely discussed. It really uh, sleeps in a valley of shame no matter where you are in the world. So I first want to discuss just a very quick overview of some of the thinking about social meanings and how social meanings are developed through the process of stigma, 
prejudices and stereotypes. I then want to go on and look at the legal perpetuation of these negative social meanings, um, particularly in how criminal laws are framed, how they're applied, and how they're interpreted by courts. Of course, there's many ways to perpetuate different social meanings, and law is only one of them. But in, given that I'm in a law faculty, that's my primary purpose. Then I want to look at some of the possible legal violations and how they've been articulated by, different, by a particular uh, uh, international human rights tribunal and think together about how that tribunal might have done a better job in capturing the negative social meanings uh, in that particular case. So social meanings, what do we mean by social meanings? In an article that is cited in the draft chapter that some of you have, um, there's an article by uh, Lawrence Lessig which I found really instrumental in understanding social meanings. And he defines it as this semiotic content attached to various actions or inactions. Now, of course, I had to go to the dictionary when he mentioned semiotic content. And that semiotics is the branch of knowledge that deals with the production of meaning of signs. So how law signifies certain uh, things and how it's, for example, how it categorizes. So it's a system of signs and how those signs convey social meaning. I had a lovely walk in your public garden today and certainly that was a social meaning that was conveyed through that park which gave me great peace. There are other signs in our society that give people a lot of stress and certainly the way we think about and have conceptualized um, and attach various meanings to abortion uh, give a lot of people a lot of stress, both those pro and against. Now, I want to stress the social part of social meaning. Social is used to, particularly to emphasize the contingency of the meaning on a particular community in which the meaning occurs. So social meanings don't exist at birth. We're all born without social meanings, but it carries, it, it carries moss. As you go through your life, you have more and you're, you're defined in different ways. So I want to particularly emphasize spoiled meanings and how meanings are spoiled through criminal law. Then I want to look particularly at stigma, prejudice, and stereotype, and how meanings about women get spoiled through these three processes. Now, stigma, prejudice, and stereotypes are complex and they're interrelated. And it's important to understand not only their interrelationship, but their distinct, the distinctive ways in which they have evolved. They have different roots in uh, social psychology, uh, and it's important to understand those roots. And one of the ways I have done it is to look at the literature on stigma, prejudice, and stereotypes on HIV, AIDS, mental health, disability and LGBT issues. Then finally, I want to look at why do we mark, prejudge, and stereotype, degrade, and discriminate. So thinking about spoiled meanings. So the production of spoiled meanings through different frameworks, through different signs, um, and why we develop those frameworks uh, of understanding. As I've said, they're contingent upon the community in which the meanings occur. Criminal law uh, determines a sexual moral order by criminalizing abortion in certain circumstances. So it does so in many ways by developing categories to create stigma. Uh, those that um, do have abortion are considered 
in some ways are consider, can be punished. Um, those who undergo abortion in some criminal systems also can be punished. So how criminal law here influences social meaning is really the nub of this uh, chapter. Let me give you another example uh, in the framing of criminal law. Many criminal laws require a reflection delay that women uh, wait three to five days, and that creates a negative social meaning about women. They're incapable of making decisions like we don't have to wait three to five days for other medical procedures. So that's creating a particular social meaning about women. So let's now turn to stigma and then prejudice and stereotypes. So stigma has been defined in this article by Anu Kumar and others to mean um, abortion stigma to mean negative attributes ascribed to women who seek to terminate a pregnancy that marks them internally or externally as inferior. It spoils their identity, to use the terms of Irving Goffman. And the article um, by Schellenberg breaks it down even further and looks at perceived stigma so women who perceive that they'll be stigmatized delay or avoid seeking services. Those who experience, experience stigma might be the experience that women have in, say, how clinics are hara they're harassed when they go to certain clinics. Then internalized stigma might be severe mental health problems leading to suicide. So when you, the stigma literature is very useful in breaking down the stigma and how it's perceived, experienced, and internalized. And that has implications for abortion. Now, prejudice, that my, my chapter that you read on stigma doesn't include this excellent article by Gregory Herrick on prejudice and LGDP issues. It's, not, it's very good on prejudice, but it's also very, it also uses the LGBT context and it is very accessible because he uses examples from that area. So it's an at, prejudice has been defined as an attitude, a category-based evaluative tendency to respond to individuals on the basis of their group membership. Herrick makes the point that prejudice is also part of a larger <coughs> cultural complex, endorsing an ideological system that disempowers, it's not talking about women particularly, but it, for our purposes, <coughs> that disempowers women through stigmatization. So it's part of a larger ideology that disempowers a particular group. In his case, he's talking about LGTP issues. In my case, I'm trying to use his work to think about it and how the ideological views on abortion um, enable, disempower the stigma against uh, pregnant women thinking about abortion. Now, the categorization often derives its content from stereotypes. And this is important for our purposes because it shows how prejudice interrelates with stereotypes. I've already mentioned one, women uh, incapable of making decisions, incapable of moral decision making. So thinking about how the categorization in the prejudice area can overlap with stereotypes, I think is ex extremely important. Now, the other thing about prejudice is it, you could also think about prejudice as the internalization, acceptance, and manifestation of stigma. So it, it really relates with stigma, and it also relates with stereotyping. And I think to understand the negative constructions of women, one has to understand and work with social psychologists to understand 
how these negative social meanings are made. Now finally, gender stereotypes. And this uh, really builds up upon a book that I did with uh, Simone Kuzak on gender stereotypes. And in that book, we really focus on the stereotyping literature and don't uh, look at the prejudice or stigma literature. Um, stereotypes can be thought of just stereotype. Stereo in Greek means firm, uh, um, a firm and type is a mold. So just going to the roots of the word, it's a firm mold. So we treat people according to preconceptions of their characteristics or of preconceptions of their roles. Now, all communities have uh, modesty, chastity, and obedience codes. They might be subtle in some countries. They might be very overt in other countries. Uh, but they, they're all there. So we do have stereotypes. They might be very embedded in our unconscious that really think about women in terms of their roles or attributes and what they should be um, or what really the, the prescriptive stereotype is probably the most important for us. So an example here is women as mothers, irrespective of their desire to be moms, therefore denying them access to information and services on abortion. So these generalized preconceptions are at work in a variety of different um, abortion laws. And we need to make clear what these preconceptions are. But before we do that, let me just go to the issue of why do we have prejudices? Why do we stereotype? Why do we stigmatize? It's a very, very brief um, highlights of some of the explanation. In Herrick's article, uh, he argues that we have prejudices to strengthen our own social ex acceptance. That's called the social expressive function. We have prejudices to an, uh, affirm our particular values. They're better than others. That's the value expressive function. We have prejudices to cope with threats. And that's called the defensive function. So there are a lot of hypotheses about why these prejudices exist, why they develop in society. And I think it's very important as one gets into the literature on abortion prejudice and uh, stereotypes is to understand some of the explanations. Now, the stereotypes, why do we stereotype? Well, we stereotype, as I've mentioned, to prescribe that women should be modest, they should be chaste, they should be obedient. But we also stereotype very innocuously, just is a part of human nature, to describe women as, in the aggregate, are weaker than men. Um, there are some women that are stronger than men, but in the aggregate, they are weaker than women, than men. So we use it uh, descriptively, um, and what is problematic is when we base our laws on that. For example, laws um, prohibiting women from being firefighters. The so in the social psychology literature, you find these explanations of describing and prescribing, uh, mis um, uh, mis I haven't spelled prescribed right. Um, the third is otherize. These are false stereotypes. As Kwame Apia explains, it's outright bigotry. Women are dumb. Um, and you see a lot of that um, when it comes to stereotyping in the abortion context. So that's a very, very brief overview, and there's so much more work to be done on the explanations of why, but if we're really going to adequately address uh, the legal perpetuation of social meanings, um, we need to really be conscious of why we develop negative social meanings. 
So let's look now at the legal perpetuation of social meaning. It happens in how we frame laws, how we apply laws, and how we interpret laws. The framing of criminal laws, I've mentioned the reflection delay requirement is uh, embedding in it a stereotype, a prejudice about women as incapable of medical decision making. And there are some other spousal authorization, parental consent also embeds stereotypes. Now these are in the administrative requirements of more liberal abortion laws. But probably more importantly is how the criminal prohibition itself marks women as immoral, as a threat to society. So, and how the criminal law frames exceptions um, to the criminal law. Um, some uh, exceptions are only framed in terms of threats to women's physical health, as though we only value women because of their physical capacity. Um, so I think we also need to think about the actual criminal prohibition and what that says and articulate that in ways that judges can work with the harm that's done. Now to do that, I want to use this case, LMR versus Argentina, which is, was recently decided by the Human Rights Committee. Terrible facts, uh, 18-year-old woman who was mentally retarded, having the age, mental age of eight, was allegedly raped by her uncle and was denied services repeatedly. Um, she went to one hospital in Cornavaca, uh, in Argentina. That hospital denied her services, even though it was legal in Argentina to have abortion when you've been raped and you have mental disabilities. There's no question that it was lawful. And yet you did not need the authorization of a judge. Nonetheless, the hospital sent her to another hospital 100 kilometers away. And uh, that hospital, the San Martin Hospital, denied her services. The, uh, the judge uh, was disciplined for not applying the law and then refusing to authorize, uh, uh, authorize the abortion. Not only the treatment of the, the woman, um, but also it misstated the gestational age, falsely recording the gestational age is later making it even more difficult for her to access services. So what the health system did in this case, backed up by the judicial system until this case got to the Supreme Court of Justice of Buenos Aires, um, was treated the woman through a moral lens rather than treating her through her actual health needs. Uh, and they found a, right, a violation of the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, a right to privacy, and a right to equal enjoyment of her civil and political rights and a denial of an effective remedy. So in essence, how the law was applied in this to LMR labeled her as deviant. It spoiled her identity in the words of Irving, Irving Goffman. It separated her from good women who would not seek abortion. Um, and it also it has to be said that there was a power differential between the judicial system and the health system. This woman and her family were poor. Um, the woman herself was young and mentally disabled. So let's, so you can see in that case how the application of the law degraded her and created all kinds of prejudices uh, and but the, the decision did not capture any of that particular kind of harm. The complaint referred to some of those harms, but the, the actual holding didn't when it discussed a violation, say for example, of the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, did not um, think about uh, the kind of stigmatic harms, the, uh, the harms to social meaning. 
let's look at a decision in terms of judicial re reasoning. I want to contrast the Colombian 2006 decision with the 2007 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that's mentioned in the article. Um, there's a handout on stereotyping that I did, wrote together with Simon Kuzak and uh, Bernard Dickens. So in the uh, Colombian 2006 decision, which liberalized a, the Colombian uh, uh, abortion law, it named the stereotype. It talked, and here I'm quoting, when the legislature enacts criminal laws, it cannot ignore that a woman is a human being entitled to dignity and that she must be treated as such, as opposed to being treated as a reproductive instrument for the human race as a reproductive instrument for the human race. The legislature must not impose the role, you know, the, the role of procreator on a woman against her will. So this decision of the Supreme Court of Colombia was really brilliant in how it named the stereotype of women and, and used that as one of the rationales for uh, liberalizing the Colombian law. So that's the kind of judicial reasoning that is in very, very helpful in changing negative social meaning. But regrettably, um, judges uh, really don't go there. They haven't had maybe a basic course in social psychology. Um, the Gonzalez case is decision is a very interesting one because you have Justice Kennedy perpetuating a stereotype of women. And here I'm reading, whether to have an abortion requires a difficult and painful moral decision. While we find no reliable data to measure the phenomenon, it seems unexceptional to conclude that some women come to regret their choice to abort the infant life they once created and sustain. Severe depression and loss of esteem can follow. So that stereotype of women as irrational and incompetent decision makers was used as a basis to prohibit a method of late-term abortion that might in some cases be safer for women. Now, we all, the risk of regret is with every medical procedure, um, and it's not inherent to uh, decisions regarding abortion. But Justice Kennedy and the majority in that decision used that as a rationale to need to pass laws prohibiting this seizure, procedure in order to protect women. So the stereotype is of women as vulnerable incapable of making medical and difficult moral decisions, therefore we can pass laws, that, therefore we can make decisions that protect them. Justice Ginsburg in dissent went ballistic, to say, to put it bluntly. She said, and I'm quoting the court, the majority deprives women of the right to make an autonomous choice, even at the expense of their safety. This way of thinking reflects ancient notions about women's place in the family and under the Constitution, ideas that have long been discredited. Then she footnoted to all those decisions going back to Bradwell, the Bradwell decision where women, uh, the Bradwell versus Illinois, where women were not allowed uh, to become members of the bar because it wasn't in their nature. Um, so she footnotes all the decisions of the Supreme Court, the most recent ones, rejecting stereotypes of, of women as rationales uh, for uh, prohibiting them in uh, certain professions, um, and also the more recent ones in terms of rejecting stereotypes in the employment sector. So these contrasting these two decisions, I think, is a useful way of understanding how the court unconsciously and consciously uses stereotypes. So I've talked about the first two violations in the LMR case, but I want to end with the right uh, to be free from all forms of discrimination against women. 
And this is a right in the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in Article 5A, um, where it explains there is an obligation of all state parties to take all appropriate measures to modify social and cultural patterns of conduct, to eliminate prejudices and practices based upon the inferiority or superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotype roles for men and women. So there's an obligation under international treaty law, and this um, obligation in Article 5A has been um, replicated in other conventions, um, particularly the African Protocol on Women's Rights, and, uh, uh, well, we'll leave it for there. Um, so there is an obligation to deal with negative social meanings, to use that term, an all-encompassing term. So let me end where I began um, and just talk a little bit about what the title of this still evolving chapter might be. Uh, and the title I chose for this actual paper is The Stigmatic Harms of Criminal Abortion Law. Well, I'm not just talking about stigma. I'm talking about all social meaning, negative social meanings. So that's why I thought, well, maybe I'll try negative social meanings of criminal abortion law. And then I thought, well, but we really need to name women here. So that's this, the, the next option, marking women through criminal abortion law. I'm really not sure, though, about the term mark, because that stigma is to mark. Stigmata is a mark. Um, and so I'm not sure I like the term mark. Um, so maybe, and I don't want to use the term degrading because uh, I also want to show how it, it um, brings in the right to equality. So I'm not sure about marking. I like marking women. I like we're naming women here. And then the final thought was, well, let's emphasize the obligations, the obligations to eliminate prejudices, stereotypes, and stigma. But then this leaves out women, and it leaves out criminal law. So love your thoughts, um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. should explain the book is aimed at a transnational audience, so it's not just focused on, on, on Canada. But certainly in terms of, yes, we don't, we, abortion has been decriminalized here, it's treated like any other medical procedure. Um, and we need to think about how we could further uh, destigmatize, um, maybe through codes of medical ethics, around the delivery of abortion services. Um, WHO is recently issued an updated version of their guidelines. And Joanna was very much involved in this. Maybe she could speak to it. Uh, uh, so guidelines for abortion services might be a way to begin to destigmatize, at least to name some of the stereotypes. Um, and where there are difficulties um, in how women are treated in seeking services. Uh, at one point, there was allegations of women being denied anesthesia. There's a lot of debates around what kind of painkiller to give. Um, so that might be a particular area where I'm not enough sufficiently on top of developments in Canada about the delivery of abortion services, but it would make a fantastic paper. Um, 
uh, and so a lot more work needs to be done on it because until we completely destigmatize de this procedure, there will be threats of recriminalization. Um, but in other countries, most other countries um, do have a criminal prohibition. Even though they liberalize the law, they retain the criminal prohibition. They just carve out exceptions. There are very few other countries like Canada. I think um, Cuba is maybe the only other one that I know of. Yep? I have a question about the slide that you put up there with respect to um, the ways in which women are stereotyped as poor decision makers, so the, the, the forced delay or the parental consent, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm curious about whether or not you think one could add to that slide, whether you think it belongs somewhere else, the notion of good enough reasons. Um, so you have to have a good enough reason for us to acquiesce to whatever it is you're asking for. Or is that something that you think is legitimate that the criminal law should be doing in a range of places and therefore should also be doing that legitimately here? Because I think in part that's what happens when people go through the guidelines for offering procedures, they try to build in you know, what will count as a good enough reason, so not, not just a rational reason, but good enough that's passed some kind of threshold that other people have set. Very helpful suggestion. These are only suggestive, and a lot more research needs to be done on how stereotypes are embedded. But I think the good enough reason um, stereotype or sufficient reason is a, is a very, very important one in how the exceptions to criminal prohibitions are framed. Um, and you, you see this. Um, so in the abortion book, it's coming up in several different ways. So there are counseling provisions in many countries. Some, are like in Germany, are dissuasive counseling. You try to dissuade the woman. Other countries, you just counsel. And that comes out of a mindset. You have to counsel as a way, as a way of trying to protect prenatal life. If you, if you counsel women, maybe they'll think twice. Um, maybe they'll not they'll decide not to have the abortion. So maybe you're counseling to make sure the reason is good enough. Um, that's certainly in, uh, embedded in the notion that you have to have a second medical opinion in those countries that have it. But certainly you point to something that's very, very important that needs a lot more work. Well, I'm going to ask you to say a little bit. And part of the reason I'm interested in this is that um, there are, there are some reasons, I mean, we're, we're fortunate in the Canadian context that you don't have to offer up a reason. Uh, in other places, you do have to offer up a reason, and there are extremes that along the continuum, and I guess I'm interested in sort of one extreme along that continuum, so my reason is social sex selection. Mm -hmm. So if I can build that into this as sort of a complicating factor. So I'm just curious as to, you know, where in your analysis that kind of a concern would fit with the concerns about stereotyping women as poor decision makers versus bringing in sort of a social moral criteria to say not a reason that socially we're going to support. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like if I, I want to look at that tough case versus you know, other cases that we might be more sympathy. And, and I don't get that. So far I haven't gotten into that in the chapter. I'm not sure I will for because it's such a complex issue in and of itself. Um, you can argue it both ways. I mean, you know, uh, and uh, you know, some might think it isn't a good enough reason. Some might think it is a good enough reason, um, depending upon that context of that particular woman. You know, if you're living in India and you have six girls, maybe it is a good reason. You know, um, so and then then that gets back to why are we prejudging that? Why are we bringing our prejudices to that? So it's it's not how I come out on that. I think it's the process of thinking about it to make sure that we name and are aware of what's happening in our unconscious about those. And often we're not. Um, so I was really interested by the, the reasons why we choose to stereotype. And they also are very self-serving, like affirming yourself, affirming your beliefs mm -hmm. through comparison. Um, and so I wondered. This yeah, just like yeah, that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had given any thought or read anything about, um, you know, because it seems like we choose to attack very aggressively uh, women who choose to get abortions or who need to get abortions. 
and um, why it is that those particular things in ourselves are the things that we feel like we need to protect the, the most strongly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, in, in I don't know the prejudice literature as well as I know the stereotyping literature, but in the stereotyping literature, um, we use negative stereotypes, malevolent stereotypes, um, when we're under threat. There's just no doubt about it. And we use them to control the other. Um, so when you have situations where societies are changing, you start, um, say, in conflict zones where there's a clash of different ethnic groups. You start, and you see this, by um, sort of uh, stoking the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes, stoking the prejudice, and you see this stoking the stigma. And that's done as almost instinctively as a way of preserving your own. And then that escalates into violence. And there is a whole social psychology literature on this that I don't, I'm not on top of. But I was on a panel a few weeks ago with a Spanish social psychologist, and he was very, very explicit on talking about how stereotypes is the first step towards ethnic violence. He was very much on top of it. He's a Spanish social psychologist has written the, the basic social psychology textbook for Spain. And so his take-home message to this audience was that if we don't get on top of this as a community, as a society, as a country, um, we, we aren't doing our job. Uh, so these explanations are, are important to understand, and they are, in the prejudice area, yes, they are all very, very defensive. They're preserving their own. And I have to be honest. When I stereotype, it is for some of these very same reasons. No. So if you're really honest with yourself, you, you do it for these reasons. So understanding these reasons helps you make un conscious what's in your unconscious. So there are many other reasons as well. This is really just a sketch. And there's a whole literature on this which would be absolutely fascinating. Um, but I just wanted to sketch this for you to say that you know, we stereotype, we have prejudices, and before we can get in touch with our own prejudices and our own stereotypes, uh, how we have to understand our own reasons for doing it. And so these are some of the reasons. But again, it's only a sketch, and there are many others, and there's a deep literature on it. And it varies from different, from say, uh, LGBT to um, to mental health uh, to women, so it, it's the whole range. And looking at it and how it evolves in different areas is fascinating. Yeah. Sure. Um, and while that slide is up, mm -hmm. uh, I I'm glad when you said that this is only a smattering of them and that there are others because when I was reflecting on it, I thought. Surely to have the, the main reason in a positive way that we prejudge and stereotype is for simplicity's sake. Um, that That's the works, description, the descriptive, you know, to, describe, to describe, to just get through the day. day. Yeah, to describe it all, yeah, to get yeah, through the day. day. I don't think we could function without prejudging certain kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so what you've done in your analysis is to give us a, a deep, and complex insight into um, what has been treated often in a prejudicial and stereotypical way, um, and you're revealing the problematic aspects of it. But when I thought about simplicity, I also thought about religion, because you didn't once mention a Catholic church in, <laughs> in um, your talking about um, international abortion laws, and I, I, and I was struck by the parallel between simplicity and religious belief, frankly. Um, that there is a comfort in religious belief that gives someone a set um, prejudice and stereotype uh, body of 
uh, approach to life that you can follow. Um, and I, I just wondered if you have reflected on that. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> and one of the reasons why I got into this stereotyping um, work was because it was a way of bringing Article 5A alive without being anti-Catholic because I didn't want to reveal my anti-Catholic prejudices. <laughs> and I thought I had to understand them. Um, and it, the, you just go to the LMR case, and it's all the Catholic. Uh, um, it was the bishop. It was the Catholic Association of Lawyers in Argentina. They were all the ones that went against LMR and prevented her from getting a timely abortion. Um, and so to understand how we stereotype, how others stereotype, how we develop prejudices, I think is first and foremost uh, the, the, the first line of attack. But then, in the, the stereotyping book, Simon Kuzak and I, I think it was in the stereotyping book, I think we did look at the debates in which the stereotyping book wasn't specific to abortion, it was just gender stereotyping. Uh, we looked at the debates in England um, about uh, women becoming bishops. And it was absolutely, just these stereotypes just popped out at us all over the place. And we talked about it in the book. Um, so yes, once you understand uh, the process, then you look at other discourses. It doesn't have to just be the legal discourse. It doesn't have to be the legal reasoning in court decisions. But it really enables you to understand uh, this was Catholic, uh, not Catholic bishops, but uh, women bishops in the, in, in the Church of England. And the discourses were, you know, they were same like in the 1800s, uh, um, going back to those cases, not allowing women to be doctors, going back to those cases, not allowing women to be lawyers. The same arguments. It's not, not in women's nature to be moral leaders. <laughs> no, and they, they actually use those terms. So, um, so in understanding um, stereotypes in all their gradations and why we use them. And yes, doing the stereotyping book, we had a huge debate about whether stereotypes could only be negative. No, there are some positive stereotypes, but you have to be very careful that those positives don't turn into negatives. Um, and it, it, you have to be very clear why you're using these stereotypes. The Madonna stereotype that's used a lot in Poland, for example, putting women on the Madonna pedestal. Um, that's really, a, it might be a positive stereotype, but it's used to keep her in the home. You know. um, in the uh, stereotyping article that I gave you, this small piece in the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics, we talk about the Irish Constitution and talking about the woman as the homemaker and how important that is. And, so you see those all over the place. But until you are sensitized and made aware of how you do it, how it happens in different discourses, I don't think you're ready to quite take on the Catholic Church, or at least I wasn't. But I have started by taking on the Church of England. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on really the role of politics in reinforcing the stereotypes. And I guess the reason I, I have this question are just the recent events in the House of Commons trying to reopen the debate as to when life begins. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Um, did you read the Globe and Mail the other day about the Prime Minister of Australia? Um, <laughs> so, I, again, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, where the um, Prime Minister of Australia, well, who, who, who actually re read it? Who, does anybody remember it? Just explain for the group what... The, uh, the head of the opposition party for saying that she had, I guess, supported someone in her own party for saying something sexist. Um, the, there was yeah, there was a call for the head of the Speaker of the House for being sexist. The leader of the opposition was calling for the head of the Speaker of the House. And, and so she took him on in Parliament, um, right across the table, pointed out through his record as a politician exactly what he had said, and basically called him a misogynist. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, Yes, I think that's another very, very important area where politics is another very important area that stereotypes are used over and over again. And we, you know, 
those who um, care deeply about these issues have to be able to call them on it, just like the Australian Prime Minister called them on it. But again, unless we can see how these stereotypes are embedded, so this, this using the pretext of life begins at the moment of conception, that needs to be dissected. You know, what's happening there? Um, uh, in some ways, you can say that life begins from the moment of conception is saying that, that w w women aren't capable of life. You know, w w you know who are they? Um, they're just erasing women. So by developing a stigma of women, by erasing them in that discussion, they're really stigmatizing women, and we have to be able to call people on that. Um, um, but again, that's another whole area that needs more research. I keep <laughs> trying to motivate everybody because this is such a fascinating area, and there's so much more work to be done on it in, in conjunction with social, sci uh, social scientists, particularly social psychologists. I wonder about, like, I've spent some time thinking about the way in which finders of fact in, in the sexual mm -hmm. assault context resort to um, schematic thinking or stereotypical thinking. And there's there's an interesting literature that suggests that that it, that this you know unconscious method of reasoning happens most of all in conditions of uncertainty, which is you know I mean this is a somewhat optimistic narrative about sexual violence. But I wonder what the analogy would. I think there's something to it, right? That and in a, in a sexual violence context, so much of it really does come down to a he said she said or he said he said context, right? And so you you, you can imagine why. Uh, the combination of that with the fact that credibility becomes you know, usually the most salient factor in, in, in the outcome. Um, triers of fact resort to you know, very socially entrenched stereotypes about, particularly about women, right? And so I wonder about what the analogy would be in terms of conditions of uncertainty. Okay, in the stereotyping book, we cite to some really uh, fascinating article by Michelle O'Sullivan, a South African legal scholar who looked at uh, divorce settlements. And th when women got good divorce settlements, uh, they were met the stereotypical good woman, good mother, good wife role. And where they didn't meet that stereotype, they were given lesser divorce set settlements. So that's, that's one area that I know of. I don't know, I haven't done any particular work in the area of sexual assault. There's another uh, New Zealand case, again, a very positive case, where the judge takes on um, uh, this, well, it's not directly the credibility of the witness, uh, and I'm not going to remember the case exactly, but he, he takes on the lower court and how they found facts. It was kind of like the Yuan Chuck case, but the Australian version. Um, but I haven't, uh, then there's a, a final scholar that did some of this work in the O.J. Simpson trial, she, the University of Miami, that's cited in the, actually in the slept bibliography to the abortion book. Uh, his name is now escaping me, but she's just, that article just, I was having coffee at a McDonald's, you know, on a Sunday morning, if you can believe it. And I ran back, I was teaching, and I ran back, I was so excited about this article that I finally got certain aspects of the criminal justice system. And I ran back to my co-author and I said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. So her, I can, I can um, look at the book and give you the article. Um, it's, it's, um, so there is some literature on that that we came across in the book and used, so. Um, a lot more work to be be done on how we stereotype credible witnesses um, in the Islamic system. You know, there you need two women. I think it's at least two women versus one man, and how we embed stereotypes in in, in that. So, but there's an awful lot more work um, that should be done in the criminal justice system per se. There is, um, oh, there's the. Uh, the Cottonfields case from the Inter-American Court on Human Rights of um, their, the women were disappeared and they, and they didn't investigate because they used stereotypes that they were just young girls out with their boyfriends. And the, the parents came and encouraging the police to investigate their disappearances and they weren't investigated. And there's evidence to suggest that if they were investigated, their, their deaths might have been prevented. 
So stereotypes in the criminal justice system are used uh, you know, a great, great deal, um, and people aren't conscious of it. So. Yeah, and I wonder whether, but I'm, I'm particularly curious about the, this idea that they are most prevalent in circumstances of uncertainty, where, where a moment of decision making occurs, and what that could mean for, for your analysis. Well, I haven't done a lot of work about circumstance of uncertainty, but say in the Ciudad Juarez, the Cotton Fields case, of course it's a highly violent situation, high, uh, migrating, you know, mm -hmm. it's on the border between El Paso, uh, Ciudad Juarez is on the border between Mexico and the U.S. So it's a very volatile situation, and the police are under tremendous stress. So, you know, they've got a zillion things to investigate, so they're going to use that stereotype probably to avoid just that one other investigation that they don't probably have time to do. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm being very charitable to them. But, so if, if you can analogize situations of uncertainty with high-stress situations, are situations of uncertainty, do they happen in high-stress situations, or do they happen just on their own? Yeah. But certainly all that work that's been done on stereotypes in, that lead to ethnic violence might, might be something you might want to look at. Mm -hmm. I guess I need to better understand what you mean by situations of uncertainty. And I, I'd want to sort of yeah. analyze that further with you to really understand what that means in particular contexts. I think the uh, one question here, I just want to mention this I issue of the context in which this happens. So in the stereotyping literature, you look at the individual context, how the individual stereotypes, then you look secondly to the context. And there's very good, where the context is neat and tidy, like an employment context, it's easy to understand the context. But in Ciudad Juarez, where it's violent, where there's a lot of migration, it's a messy, messy context. So it's harder to understand the context and how stereotypes play out. And then there's the underlying conditions, and that gets to religious views, <coughs> etc. So there's a, that three, three levels. So. Um, just to comment on that discussion, that happens to be the area of research in my program, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Which uh, areas of uncertainty? Or, uh, or? The sexual assault context okay. and mm -hmm. stereotypes. By the trier of fact, actually. Um, and what I found is that often these cases, because they're in the HRM, are about drinking. Um, so a woman goes to drinking and then wakes up the next morning and, and there's evidence of a sexual assault or seeks treatment for a sexual assault that night. Um, and that I found a lot of stereotypes by the Crown, the defense, and the judge centered around she's engaging in drinking, therefore she's essentially asking for it. She's putting herself in, in a situation of risk. Um, and if she had to you know, her, if she had gone home with someone that she didn't know, if she didn't go out in the first place, you know, all these things, um, that she would have found herself in that situation. Um, and so I was specifically looking for these stereotypes in the three groups, and sadly they're immensely prevalent. And just, like I said, crown test judge everybody. And what are you doing in your project to name them, to sort of We're pop? We're gathering data so that it's oh, uh, okay. easy to find for the center. That's mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And John, and then there's one in the back. Yeah. Oh, I'll just answer uh, mm -hmm. something with respect to those conditions of uncertainty. So Herrick, uh, when he was looking at uh, stigma and prejudice uh, with respect to sexual orientation, found one of the greatest quote cures was putting people in the room together, right? So this kind of personal familiarity, right? Which is kind of a hokey claim, but actually empirically it shows some truth to matter, right? That so long as you actually have some evidence in front, right, some personal experience with something that you can no longer rely on stereotype because you know a case to be right, true of the opposite, yeah. that this did fundamentally affect the capacity of people to short circuit and go to those, stereotypes those, immediately. Yeah. yeah. So there's been a lot. Of, so I yeah. go to that literature yeah. around what that kind of direct contact to contact. And this, you know, in abortion context, the claim was 
uh, part of the reason why it remains so stigmatized is because people don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. well, and because you don't is, talk about it, you don't, exactly, yeah. because you don't talk about it, you don't get to know this one in three women who are having terminations, yeah. of which more likely than not, if someone, you know, looking around you absolutely is that mm -hmm. person. And so it's, again, that kind of the degree to which there's a secrecy or um, idea of not talking about it and not sharing, but, you know, the idea is, is that in abortion you need a... Uh, uh, a social process akin to coming out of the closet, right? Yeah. That happened, right, in the yeah. coming out of the closet. In the LGBT movement, it was something akin to that in the abortion movement. And so, and so too with sexual violence. So I, yeah. my question was more aimed at how would that apply in the abortion context, right? So that if, it's a, if in some contexts this stereotypical or kind of schematic thinking resorting to these preconceived concepts is a way of knowing then some response, whether it be abortion, sexual violence, uh, sexual minority discrimination, some response must be aimed at a different, uh, you know, mechanisms that reorient the way way of knowing. Right, and that's yeah. why I asked um, the student in the back yeah. who's doing uh, th th this importance of naming. Yeah. It's just so critical. Yeah. Popping it up, naming it, discussing it, and a, a lot of judges, like the Colombian uh, decision, is quite good at that. Um, but they could be so much better at it you now, and, and that it's so important. The Copperfields <coughs> case by the Inter-American Court, there's the Karen Atala case where they did discuss stereotypes, um, but the whole, the judicial reasoning around these the prejudice, stereotypes, and stigma is so critical, and when you analyze these decisions, it's just, a, it's the exceptional decision that does it. So. Yeah. It, it, Joanna's referring to the contact thesis, um, which is, so the more contact you have, and I think there's probably a whole literature on whether, the, in which situations the contact thesis or hypothesis works. Okay. Such and in the abortion context, which is interesting in the sexual assault context, is the claim that this is a transient condition, right? You're not, you know, you're not a person who walks around always as a survivor or victim, right? right. You're not a person who walks around always as someone who's had an abortion, you know, in the same way that, right, racial identity or sexual, right, minority identity or so forth. So the idea is, to what extent as this trait is transient, do you not get social movements for coming out of the closet and identifying, yeah. and you can't come in, quote, contact with these people who represent, right, this group, because they're never the same, you know, and they can kind of, quote, disappear into, right, general populations, and can often be the people who will then enact the prejudice against their same group that they were once a member of. So I think that that is, I mean, it's a good question, because these seem to change uh, a lot uh, in contrast to some of the work that's done on stigma and prejudice with respect to what we might call as, you know, uh, kind of uh, staying traits, right? Yeah. And, and I should say that the social psychologist's work on abortion is, I think there's three articles max. There's, uh, the Kumar article that I cited, the Schellenberg article, and I think there's one other, and that's it, if you can believe it. I mean, it's, it's really quite shocking. Yeah, I was just wondering, so you were talking about um, the importance of naming, mm -hmm. and I know that you said you hadn't looked into it much, but kind of going back to the, um, um, the good enough reason, social selection, things. so are you, are you saying that it's more important that we recognize that we have these stereotypes and things that we're, that we're using to build law and whatever. Um, it, it's, are you saying that it's more important that we kind of acknowledge that we're doing it than it is to kind of stop doing it? Because for, for, particularly for the... I, I don't think it's a question of more or less. Uh -huh. It's a question if we're going to be serious about dismantling stereotypes, prejudices, and stigma, we have to understand how we ourselves um, stereotype, develop prejudice, and stigmatize other people. Because if we can't understand how we do it, then it's very difficult to understand how it's done more generally. Um, so that's why I think the section on why we do this is, is very important, just as a way of sensitizing people. Now, there's also a lot of uh, literature on dismantling this, um, these stereotypes. And I haven't really gotten into that because it's really looking at um, how you change views. And that's 
not really, you know, in ter helpful. I didn't find it helpful in terms of how we change, you know, change laws because laws you have to find a violation. Um, so, but in the LMR <coughs> case, for example, when they found a violation of the right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment, um, they really didn't discuss any of this. Um, very, very disappointing. Um, so just, there is a, a PhD thesis coming out um, from, actually from an Australian PhD law student on uh, the use of inhuman and degrading treatment in the abortion context, which I think will be very, very useful. I don't recall how much it gets at the discussions by courts of stereotypes, prejudice, and stigma. I was just wondering if you could comment about um, like the, the limitations that come when you frame movements to liberalize abortion laws around choice and like how that plays out in terms of like seeing the way that all this like the states, the United States, like all their laws keep coming back and forth and like there's a lot of assumptions I think that are embodied around notions of choice and like and who can choose and, and what does that mean and, and when that becomes the main platform for forming laws. Um, then, like, whose interests are, are being, who's, who's are protected under those, and then, and like, how is maybe also the idea of choice, like, uh, stereotyped as well in that context? Because it, it was like the main um, platform for quite a long time for, for arguing for um, liberalizing abortion laws. So, I think the major limitation of framing the reproductive rights movement around choice is that it doesn't get at the health disparities. Um, it, we, all, we know that it, where we have restrictive abortion laws, it's poor women generally who have very difficult times getting it. So it disproportionately impacts on poor women and that usually correlates with race, um, um, ethnicity, and certainly by age in the abortion context. I mean, um, adolescents are by and large poor. So by framing it around choice, you, you fail to grasp the distributive justice, the reproductive justice elements ab about that. Now, in terms of thinking about um, the negative social meanings of not grasping the social justice dimensions of issues, I think the way the negative social meanings and in ensuring that you frame this as an equality issue, we generally tend to stereotype others um, in negative terms, others that are different from us. It could be adolescents, it could be poor people, it could be people who are racially marginalized. So I think the two intersect in very, very important ways. And I didn't get in, in, involved at all, but in the book we have a whole section called compounded stereotypes. So you're not only stereotyping on, on grounds of gender, you're stereotyping on ground, other grounds as well, and they intersect and compound in ways. Um, and certainly in the abortion context, I think the, one of the more critical areas to look at is uh, how we think of s stereotypes of adolescents, because it's adolescents who disproportionately bear the burden of restrictive laws. Um, they come late, um, they, they, Joanna is right that, that a, a abortion stigma is transient, but with adolescents, there's a much higher threat of internalized stigma that stays with that adolescent and probably affects their mental health in ways that we don't even begin to understand. Um, so even though that adolescent might be successful in, in, in getting an abortion, usually under very difficult circumstances, that how, how that procedure has marked that adolescent, I'm sure has mental health consequences way beyond the act of, of the, so the self-stigma, um, there's several cases on the international, I, one of the things I want to do with this article, oh, by the way, I haven't gotten any responses to the, the last, uh, my title <laughs> question. Um, one of the, the things I want to do in the uh, chapter is to look at all, uh, there's probably about uh, eight abortion cases at the international level and there's one very tragic case where an adolescent tried to commit suicide so um, so there's that I think that felt stigma that internalized stigma issue is a very important one even though they're not physically blemished they're 
they're internally blemished, and that, that stays with me. So before I invite you to join me in thanking Rebecca, I wanted to mention our next seminar, which is Friday, October 26th, so it's in just two weeks. It's by Evelyn Fox Keller of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she'll be speaking on legislating for catastrophic risk unless she changes the title. <laughs> uh, now, one of the things I did not mention yet from Rebecca's bio is that she spent from 2004 to 2007 at the University of the Free State in South Africa. She was on the Faculty of Law there, and she had the title there of Professor Extraordinarius. <laughs> And we can see how she earned the title. So please join me in thanking.